Anybody here in the witness protection program? Fugitives from justice. The reason I ask is, uh, in a couple of minutes, you're probably going to see some big cameras come into the room and they'll start scanning. So I've, I was asked to tell you, and this is actually NYU policy, that if you don't want to be on, this is going to be CNBC, so nobody watches anyway. Okay? <laughs> Oh, very few people watch, and they're kind of selected. They don't care about you. They're looking at the numbers in the background while you're talking. Okay? So if you don't want to be there, I have a few paper bags with holes cut out, so you can put it over your face, okay? or you can just duck. But I would tell you to act like the cameras are not here. But that's like, you know, the old, the old Greek mythology, you know, the Medusa. Was it Medusa that you looked at, you turned to stone? So don't look at the Medusa. What kind of advice is that? Because you're going to look at the... So I'm going to look at the camera. That's all I want you to do is look at the camera. Forget about me. Hopefully that will mean you'll turn your attention to it. So act like it's not here. Okay? Because I'm going to act like it's not here. Okay? So, so if, you, if, you, if you can, do that. Okay? So it's, it's, I agree. It's going to be a little distracting. But don't, it's only, they're not going to be here for all 80 minutes. So prob- they promised me five minutes and out of here. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off. On Monday, I promised you on Monday that if you get got your holdings for your company, the HDS page or the Yahoo Finance holdings, that we could do the very first part of the project in class. And I'm going to deliver on that promise. So here's what I'm going to spend the first few minutes talking about. I'm going to talk about how looking at those top 17 stockholders might help you as a stockholder. That's all I'm asking. As a stockholder, what do I need to worry about in this company? What the potential conflicts of interest are. So I'm going to argue that when you look at your company, it's probably going to fall into one of these eight groups. And I'll go through each of the eight groups and talk about them. Okay? So for the moment, just put this picture to the side because this is the big picture. And I'm going to actually take one example of each of the eight groups. And if you have your list, take a look at your list. If you don't have your list, then don't take a look at your list. Okay? But when you do get the list, you can take a look at it. So here is the first and most common top 17 stockholder page you're going to see. ExxonMobil. Top 17 stockholders. What did I say about the 13F filing? Institutional investors. Take a look. All 17 investors. I call this the institutional default. And what do we say about these companies as a stockholder? You have very little power over these companies because none of these guys will stand up and fight for you. And it's not their fault. That's the way they're hardwired. So that's the first group. So maybe if you have a lot, especially if you have a large market cap company, it doesn't have to be a U.S. company. Any large market cap company, a Siemens, okay? you're probably going to see yourself looking at a list very much like this one. You might not see a 13F because you don't have that filing in Germany, but you're going to see the 17 institutional investors. Let's move to the second type of HDS page you might look at. This is Rio Tinto. And who's the largest stockholder in Rio Tinto? Rio Tinto. How the heck does this happen? This is actually what happens when you create these shell corporations and you move things around. Royal Dutch was notorious for this. They had like six companies, and you, have ne- you never had any idea at any point in time where the actual company was. If you walk down New York, the city streets in New York City, there are these guys with little shell games. They invite you to $10, come over, tell me which, now which, uh, which shell, the whatever, the, whatever their hide is. That's basically what Royal Dutch was doing. So if you try to take over Royal Dutch, you'd spend all this money, billions of dollars, buying a company. They'd say, aha, uh-huh, you bought the wrong company. There's nothing there. It's a controlled device. It makes no sense because it just messes up your life. You think, why hold a company that holds another company that holds another company? Anytime you see complexity, the hidden story there is it's being used to keep the rest of the world up. So that's the second possibility. Look at your company. You're going to see your own company up there. Don't freak out. It can happen. Third, this is uh, Gazprom. Think like a stockholder in Gazprom. You look at that list. Do you feel comfortable about what you see on that list? Who's the largest single stockholder in Gazprom? Oh, it's the Russian government. They're a very benevolent stockholder, right? But in general, if you see the government as the largest stockholder in a company, first stop that you need to make is, how did they get there? I mean, let's face it, governments don't have money to invest. They're usually running deficits, right? 
So when you see the government be the largest stockholder in a company, and you're going to see this in a lot of European utilities, for instance, a lot of oil companies in emerging markets, how did they get there? 20 years ago, if you looked at these companies, what would you have seen? They were government-owned companies. Then they were privatized. Right? And when they were privatized, the government sold off a chunk of the company, but it held on to enough of the company that it controls the company. But let's take it to the next step. Let's say you're a stockholder in a company where the government is the largest stockholder or one of the largest stockholders. Do you see any potential conflicts of interest coming down the pike? In other words, do you see scenarios where you want the company to do something that's in your best interest as a stockholder but the government might step in and say, no, that doesn't make sense for us. Give me one example. Anybody? One example where what's good for the government and what's good for you might clash. Outsourcing labor. One is outsourcing labor, right? Outsourcing labor, usually to another country. So if the government is the largest stockholder, so let's say you're the German government and the largest single stockholder in BMW. German wages are among the highest in the world. And BMW says, look, we'd like to build our next factory in China. Might make complete economic sense to the stockholders, but the government is going to put up its hands and say, no, I don't think that makes sense. You're saying, but they're not thinking like stockholders. They have other interests to take care of as well, right? Because those workers who lose their jobs now will have to collect unemployment from the government. So they have to say, look, I have to wait. Any other things where you might see the government step in? Any other potential examples? Yes. In other words, we talked about social costs and social benefits. The government might say, you know what, there are lots of social costs in this investment, don't do it. But there's a line item in the income statement where I think having the government as a stockholder could potentially have a huge impact. What am I talking about? Taxes. What I'm going to say is going to sound mildly unpatriotic, but hang in there anyway. If you are the stockholder in a company, do you want the company to maximize taxes paid to the government? or minimize taxes, subject to the constraint that you follow all the rules. It's to minimize taxes, right? So let's say you're a company where the government is the largest stockholder. You're paying a 45% tax rate. The CEO gets up and says to the board of directors, you know what, guys, we're paying too high a tax rate. We've hired some really good tax lawyers to bring our tax rate down legally. I'm covering myself fully as I'm going along. Every director will agree, except for the two directors who are there for the government. They're going to say, hey, I don't think that's such a great idea. You say, why not? Well, when you pay less taxes, that's less revenue for the government. A couple of years ago, I actually compared the average tax rates for companies where the government is the largest stockholder to the average tax rate of other companies in the same peer group where the government is not a stockholder. No surprise. The average tax rate where the, com where the government is the largest stockholder is about 10% higher than for the pure group, reflecting it. Again, I'm not saying this is good or bad, but you need to see this coming down the pike as a stockholder. And of course, if the Russian government is the largest stockholder, your problems are piling up. And it's not just taxes, it's not just investment decisions, it's not just outsourcing. No, but we'll come back and talk about it. There's a very special corporate governance system in Russia, which I can't even begin to describe, but we will mention it in the context of corporate governance. So maybe the government is not doing its job well enough in Gazprom. They should be pushing for a higher tax rate. But we'll talk about there's a web of potential conflicts of interest in Russian companies that make them a complete mess to analyze. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Next example. There are some companies, when you look at the company, you don't even have to go dig deeper. We looked at our accrues, right? Two classes of shares. Two classes of shares. Remember what I said. If you own shares in that company, this might sound cynical, but you're probably owning the shares without the voting rights, and somebody else controls the company. This is true in News Corp, right? You think bad companies, they do stuff like that. Good companies would never do this. A few years ago, Google, I think, changed the rules for the worse in this game. You remember, when Google went public, they created two classes of shares. For a long time in the US, you couldn't do this. 
If you wanted to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, you could not have two classes of shares. That's why you go back in history and say, Microsoft doesn't have two classes of shares. Apple doesn't have two classes of shares, because those were the rules of the game then. But Google, essentially, because of their power, when they went public, decided to change the rules of the game. And in fact, every social media company is following the Google model, right? Basically, doing the same thing. And Google, of course, has you know, these shares where one class of shares is 10 times, 50 times, 100 times the voting rights of the other class. That's it. You're done. When you see two classes of shares, your conflict of interest, your corporate governance analysis is over. Don't dig any deeper. That's it. Because in this company, we ask you, how much power do you have as a stockholder? The answer is very little, because those voting shareholders will run the company. Will they run the company well? Maybe in the case of Google, that might be your answer. It doesn't matter. In the case of Facebook, it might be exactly the same answer. I trust Mark to make the right decisions for me. But here's the problem you face. When you buy these non-voting shares, you're essentially locking in these managers in perpetuity. Right? Basically, it's not just you have to try Mark Zuckerberg for the next five years. It's essentially for the rest of the life of the company. I know you can sell the stock and move on, but that's a cowardly act, right? Basically, you've given up on the company. So your job, in a sense, when you look at these companies is to, ref to is already incorporate the fact that coming down the line, three years, five years, ten years from now, there will be a conflict of interest where what's good for those voting shareholders is not good for you. And you have no weapons because you gave them up at the start of the process. Fourth example. I won't even try to explain what's going on here. But this is the LVMH. Uh, it's a French company where, you know, it's Bernie Arnault. Is that, is that how you pronounce his name? Essentially controls all of these companies. And he controls them by having a web of stock holdings across the companies. So he controls a dozen companies essentially by letting them own stock in each other. This is not uncommon in Asia and Latin America. In Asia, for instance, you have the pyramid groups. You know how pyramid groups work? You own 51% of company A, but it does absolutely nothing. It's a shell company. Company A owns 51% of com no, companies B, C, D, and E, but they do nothing. They're shell companies. And you go all the way down to the base of the pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid are all the operating companies. You think, what does this accomplish? Basically, you can control these companies by having 51% of 51% of, depending on how many layers in the pyramid there are, with 2.5% of the stock, you can control the companies at the bottom. So again, when you see these very complex cross-holding structures, you're essentially seeing one more device to keep control of these companies. So some of your companies, you're going to look at the holdings and say, what the heck is going on here? And the answer might be, these companies are constructed in a way that it's not just you as a small stockholder who will have little role in the company. You could be a big stockholder in this company and have no role in how the company is run. Okay. This is Oracle. You look at who's on top. Larry Ellison, right? Founder, CEO. With young companies, do not be surprised to see the founder, CEO on top. So when you look at Facebook's holdings page next week, or two weeks from now, six weeks from now, First, you'll have two, two sets of pages, right? One for the voting shares, one for the non-voting shares. Non-voting shares, you're not going to see Zuckerberg on the list. Among the voting shares, he basically is going to control, I think, by you know, 80%, 85% of the voting rights. Okay. So when you look at pages at, at young companies, don't be surprised to see the founder on top. For, for instance, Microsoft, for 20 years after they went public, if you looked at the top, and it still is true, but the magnitude has dropped off. It's Bill Gates. He owned 25% of the company, then became 20, 18, 16. So why is it going down? Because as you age, you tend to reduce your holding. Because you're trying to cash out, you're trying to diversify. And Bill Gates also has a, has a, has a foundation that he, he passes the shares to. So now I think he's down to 8 9%. But with young companies, and I still think of Microsoft as a young company, you'll often see an individual on the list not because they went and bought the shares, but because they're the founders kind of still hanging in there with their holdings. This is JetBlue. The largest single stockholder in JetBlue is Lufthansa. In other words, there are some companies where the largest holder in the company is another company. Some of this might be strategic. In the case of Lufthansa, this is an investment they made in JetBlue because this is where they saw growth in the U.S., isn't the 
So this is not because of any elaborate control device. It's, it's an investment they've made to kind of grow over, over time. Philip Morris, for instance, was the largest single stockholder in Kraft for a decade. What's tobacco got to do with food? Nothing. But for them, it was an investment that they made. So sometimes you can have a company be the largest stockholder in a company. And this could be true for your company. And you're going to say, what do I do next? Do companies have money? Sounds like a stupid question, but humor me. Does Apple have a lot of money? No, Apple doesn't have money. Apple stockholders have money that Apple happens to hold. You know what I'm trying to say? When a publicly traded company is the largest stockholder in your company, Publicly traded companies are not the holders, it's the investors in those companies. Your job just got a little mess here. To find the top 17 stockholders in JetBlue, you know what you need to do? Go pull up the holdings page for Lufthansa. Because in a sense, this is almost an indirect investment in JetBlue. Right? Last example. This is Procter & Gamble. Huge consumer product company, largest in the world. Look at the list. It looks like any other list, right? 13F, 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 13F. They're all institutional investors. But you notice one institutional investor there who might not be like every other institutional investor? Berkshire Hathaway. Who the heck are they? For lack of a... I mean, they're Warren Buffett's investment vehicle. Now, let me ask you a question. This is all about you and I as stockholders, right? You're asking, do I feel comfortable in this company? Looking at that list, do you feel a little more comfortable than you did with Exxon Mobil? And why? Because Berkshire Hathaway, or Warren Buffett, historically, he's not been a pure passive investor. He's been an investor who invests, and he gets on the board of directors, he gives advice, and he generally tends to get listened to because of his history. You're saying if Procter & Gamble decide to do something really stupid, I don't think Warren Buffett will let them do it. You're trying to piggyback on somebody's, somebody else, right? Because you and I, with a thousand shares, can't fight this fight. You need somebody else to fight the fight. So when you look at companies at, at the top holders, if you see, yeah, if you see a company there, and you're not sure who that institutional investor is or that group, kind of look beyond. Right? Carl Icahn, for instance, you'll never see Carl Icahn's name. You'll see the investment group that he controls. So I'll send you a link the later after class today so you can see by activist investor what group they use to, to get control because you're looking for something, somebody rocking the boat here, kind of challenging managers when they get off the reservation. Any questions about, about the holdings page? As I told you, it's like Medusa, don't look there, right? <laughs> okay, so let me close this up because, you know, Okay, so let's go back to where I left you on Monday. We're talking about different corporate governance systems. We're talking about the Japanese system and the German system, right? Let me recap what I said. I said the J Japanese and the German system were incredibly successful for four, four decades, building up the economy, building up companies. And they were very good at dealing with individual companies that were badly managed, but that they failed when you had a systematic problem, right? with J Japan that took the form of bank loans in the, uh, to real estate in the early 1990s. In Korea in the late 1990s, it took the form of companies borrowing too much money. But everybody borrowed too much money, so nobody had an incentive to step in and say, hey, we shouldn't be doing it. But whenever you have systems like these, which are essentially elitist systems, basically a group making a judgment on what's right for the entire system, here's a side cost. That group could be wrong, right? They could make a mistake, and they won't admit their mistakes. In fact, let's update this, because the, the corporate governance system that is getting a lot of press right now is the Chinese corporate governance system. And how does the Chinese corporate governance system work? Let's say you invest in a Chinese company. You're a stockholder. You don't like the way it's run. You have zero role in how the company is run, except that right off the top. So you can say, why can't I go to the annual meeting and vote? Nobody cares. So why can't I get the board of directors to do something for me? They, they really don't listen to you. They work for the management. But the Chinese corporate governance system, the mechanism for replacing bad managers is centralized. 
it's centralized in Beijing or wherever the, I mean, it's a system where you have a centralized group essentially say, these companies are well run, these are badly run, this is what you should be expanding in. So it's, a, it's, it's an extension, in a sense, of the Japanese system. In fact, in Japan, you used to have this group in the Ministry of Finance that was very highly regarded. These were the smartest people in Japan. They were hired and their job was to direct the entire economy. And again, for 40 years, they did everything right. Until they didn't. And here's the problem with hiring the smartest people, telling them they're the smartest people, and putting them in charge of things. When they make mistakes, they will not admit it. That's the nature of, of, of it's human nature. And the smarter you are, the more difficult it becomes for you to admit your mistakes. My problem with the Chinese system or offshoots of it is essentially they're saying, trust, trust us, we know what we're doing. And for the moment, you might say, hey, they, they look like they know what they're doing. But what if they make a mistake? What's the correction mechanism you've built in? The true test of the Chinese system or the Indian system, whatever other alternative corporate governance system, will be not in the good times, but in the bad times. It's like having a coach for a basketball team, right? If you're 16 and 0, nobody notices your flaws. You're perfect. You lose four games in a row, all of a sudden, every problem you have comes to the surface. And that's when the good coaches and the bad coaches separate, right? If you're a bad coach, you just spin out of control. If you're a good coach, you find your way to kind of get back to doing what worked for you. And corporate governance systems really have to be put to the test before you decide that you're going to trust them. So at the moment, as I said, if you're looking for an alternative to the stockholder-based system, which is what the US and the UK historically have used, you can look at these other systems, but test them. Test them as to their pluses and minuses. They have their advantages. They're much less, they have fewer side costs. You don't have hostile takeovers. You don't have the mess that comes with the market-based system. But you also have problems that can endure for the long term, because nobody wants to fix those problems. So that's the first choice. Go with a different corporate governance system. Here's the second one. Rather than maximize value, maybe you can pick a different set of object objectives or a different objective. Let's look at a few. Maybe you can increase market share. That was actually the favorite objective for many Japanese companies in the 1980s. They said, forget about market value. We want to go for higher market share. It could be to maximize profits. Accounting profits, after all, those accountants spend a lot of time coming up with those numbers, might maximize that number. It could be to maximize cash flows, maximize re revenue growth. I mean, you can think of lots of different objectives. And God help you if you hire a consultant to come into your company, because they'll come with their own customized number to maximize. Because that's the way they make their money, right? So if you called in Holt Associates in the 1990s, they say, oh, you have to maximize CFROI? You say, what the heck is CFROI? We can't tell you. That's why you need us around all the time. <laughs> and, that, and that's the name. I mean, I don't blame them because if they told you what it was, said, that's it, they're gone, right? So they've got to keep it under cover and make it look like some mysterious number that you have to focus. And it becomes a magic bullet. If you, if you maximize that, CFROI, EBA, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, we'll come back and talk about it in the context of this class. And after I tell you what it is, you can say, we pay people to tell us this? It's obvious, but that's, you know, that's the nature of the process. You could pick that objective and say, hey, this is so much simpler than maximizing value. I don't have a problem with you doing that. Lots of companies do. I mean, you've worked at companies where if you look at their plans, it's let's double revenues over the next five years. Let's increase margins to 15%. Clearly, they're, they're set as objectives. I don't have a problem with you picking one of those objectives as long as you remember that they're intermediate objectives. See what I mean by intermediate objectives? Maximizing market share for the sake of maximizing market share is a stupid objective. And here's why. Would you want 100% market share of a market? Don't answer the question until I complete this, the question because would you want 100% market share of a market where you have to sell below cost? Who does, right? You get 100% market share, but you lose a ton of money. Market share makes sense only if you can tell me how it allows you to make more money. So you know this, how the story would go, right? We get more market share, we get more pricing power. We get more pricing power, we get more profits. We get more profits, we get more value. But there's many a slip between the cup and the lip there, right? Because you increase market share, you increase pricing power, already you might have a problem. 
Because that's what the Justice Department views as its way of saying, hey, that breaks the antitrust law. Let's say you slip under the radar. You're also assuming that the competition is just going to let you run, run crazy here. This is the objective that has driven the airline business to distraction over the last 35 years. I still remember when American Airlines got a new CEO in the early 80s, a guy called Robert Crandall came in as a CEO. Dynamic guy. I still remember watching his first press conference. And he announced his objective in American was to make, was to make it the number one domestic U.S. airline. Notice he didn't say most valuable U.S. airline, most profitable, number one domestic U.S. airline. And by 1989, it succeeded. American was the number one domestic U.S. airline in terms of number of passengers flown and market share. But there were only two airlines in 1989 making money, and neither of them was called American. <laughs> one was Alaska Air, because nobody else wanted to fly to Fairbanks, I guess. And the other was the nascent Southwest, the young Southwest. You know what they did? They flew from Dallas to Houston and back again and back again and back again and back again. The exact opposite of a market share view, right? They said, if we can make money, we will fly from Dallas to Houston and the wings fall off. I know LA to New York is glamorous, but if we don't see a way to make money, we're not flying that. Market share by itself is a dangerous objective. You're saying, but everybody knows that. You know what happens if you pick an objective? People get measured against that objective. And after a while, they forget, they lose sight of the ultimate objective. How many of you are planning to go work and invest in banks because they have their own version of this market share? It shows up every quarter for them. What am I talking about? What does every investment bank focus on? Deal tables. Look, we're number one on the deal table. Congratulations. How do you get to be number one? We have to do big deals. Really big deals. Does it matter that you make money on those deals? Kind of side story. Let's put that to the side. And guess what? On that Facebook IPO, you're going to be lined up to be part of that deal, even if you're going to lose money on that deal. You know why? Because it's a big deal. It's a big deal that's going to move you up the deal table. So the same investment banks that like to take apart companies for focusing on market share are themselves focused on their own version of market share. So if you're going to pick a different objective, remember that there is an ultimate objective. And put this objective to the test. You know what I mean by the test? Think of the worst things that can happen if you turn managers loose with this objective. Because they will. So what if I tell everybody, go out and maximize market share. Think through the consequences. So already you can see my self-serving way of steering you back. No, I might not succeed to where I'd like you to be, right? I said, if you want to pick a different corporate governance system, do so. But if there's a big problem that cuts across companies, it's going to break down. You can pick a different objective, but if you let it run loose, who knows what will end up happening. So let me give you my sales pitch for why I think maximizing value should still be your objective, even though we've talked about all the things that can go wrong. In fact, I think maximizing stock prices as a central objective is still an objective that I can defend. And here's the reason. It's not because markets don't make mistakes. They screw up all the time. It's because it's the only self-correcting objective that's out there. Know what I mean by self-correcting? We talked about all those different groups, right? Managers, lenders, financial markets, society. And we talked about everything that can go wrong. Managers take advantage of stockholders. Firms rip off lenders. Information to financial markets is often delayed and sometimes you know, sometimes over the line. It's fraud. Markets are not rational and there are social costs. But here's the counter that I'm talking about. When managers take too much advantage of stockholders, there's what I'm going to call a piss-off point. Okay? It's a technical term. It's a point where you as a stockholder say, enough. I've had enough. You by yourself might not be able to do much with a thousand shares. But when you reach the point, there are other people out there who might be able to exploit that to change management. We'll talk about some of the devices. If you take advantage of lenders, we talked about Nabisco bondholders. Bond markets learn. They adapt. They start putting in things into bonds to protect themselves against the next Nabisco. Doesn't protect them against somebody else trying something different. But you see protections built in. You try to take advantage of financial markets, there's a blowback effect, which is if you lie to markets, you hold back information. After a while, markets start reacting to that. 
And finally, if you create too many social costs, it could become an economic cost. So let's take each of the linkages and let's talk about this counter in the process. So let's first take managers who essentially cross the line, who have taken too much advantage of stockholders. You see a backlash, and the backlash, backlash takes a couple of forms. One is you do see some institutional investors wake up. We talked about most institutional investors being passive. In the mid-80s, if you looked at all institutional investors, they were all passive. And the, one of the first institutional investors to wake up and say, we can't keep running from this problem. Because every, ultimately there's no place to run was the California Pension Fund. I mentioned them, CalPERS. And starting in 1986, CalPERS has done a couple of things. One is they've tried to incorporate corporate governance into their investment decisions. In other words, they will not invest in companies where they feel the managers are not receptive, at least, to what the stockholders are saying. And they also started publishing a list of what they called the worst 10 companies. And I, in fact, I sent you the link. I don't know whether you clicked on the link. But they actually keep a watch list of these companies. And it used to be in the mid-'80s that they went, took the next step. And what the next step was was they'd take these 10 worst companies and they would invest in them. Sounds perverse, right? But you know what they were trying to do? They were saying, look, we're big stockholders. These are badly run, badly managed companies. We can make a difference in these companies by throwing our weight around. So it used to terrify companies when they showed up on that list with CalPERS because they knew what was coming down the pipe. And in the years after, there are some mutual funds that have been created to do this. They tend to be small. Fidelity will never have an activist mutual fund. It's just too difficult for them, and they have too many other you know, pots on the, on the boiler. They have too many things going on. So it's usually funds like the Lens Fund, small fund focused on corporate governance. And of course, in the last decade, you've had new players in the game, the KKRs, the Blackstones. The subset of private equity investors who are truly activist. So what do you mean by that? Most private equity investors are really not that activist. They're activists only until it becomes painful to be activist, and then they walk away. So they're more like value investors. But there are some private equity investors who essentially focus on these companies and try to change the way these companies are run. So that's the first thing that boils up, is if you overreach, those institutional investors might start buying stock in your company and trying to change you. You also have individuals, the Carl Icahns, the Ron Perlmans, the Bill Ackmans of the world, who make it their life to find badly managed companies. And then make it then the focus of their economic benefit to go out and change the way these companies are run. I mean, somebody asked me a few years ago, what, what, this is an interview about Carl Icahn, he'd been making a lot of money. They said, what's his big competitive advantage? And as it's not his depth in corporate finance, the guy's about an inch deep. Because basically, here's what Carl Icahn does when he, goes, when he finds a company to target. He says, you have too much cash, give me the cash. That's it. That, if you dig through all the verbiage, that's pretty much what he says. But you know what his skill is? He targets the right companies. He finds companies where the existing stockholders are so mad at the management that they're willing, essentially, to put their votes with anybody who might challenge the managers. In fact, if you're ever stockholders in a company that Carl Icahn happens to target, Get ready for a sequence of things that will happen in your company. Remember those proxies we talked about that most of us throw into the trash can? If you're in a Carl Icahn targeted company, you're going to get a phone call almost simultaneously with that proxy saying, hey, we know you got the proxies in the mail today. We know you're re getting ready to throw it into the trash can. But would you be willing to hand those 1,000 shares over to us? us being the people challenging the management. It's called a proxy fight. It doesn't happen at most companies, but these companies that have kind of crossed the line, you see that happening. With those proxy fights always, we're not necessarily, but the very fact that there's a proxy fight scares incumbent managers, they come to the table. And at Blockbuster, Carl Icahn actually got enough proxies in his side that he was ab actually able to get his directors elected at the annual meeting rather than the directors on the top management slate. So that's the first wave of the counter, is you see this, this thing boiling under the surface. And you'll know when it's happening as a company, that it's starting to happen. Of course, the extreme way in which I might get your attention if you're a badly managed company is if there's a hostile acquisition. You know, hostile acquisitions have acquired a bad name. You look at any movie based on hostile acquisitions, other than other people's money, it's obvious who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. 
The good guys are obviously the managers of the company who want to stay in the company. The bad guys are, of course, the hostile acquirers. And that might be true in some companies. But this is an empirical question. What kinds of companies get targeted in hostile acquisitions? Is it good companies that are going to get ruined? Or is it companies that deserve to be targeted? There are lots of studies that have looked at targets of hostile acquisitions. They've come to a consensus. This is across the studies. The typical target firm in a hostile acquisition has earned a return on equity. And again, if you're not familiar with, the, with the, how it's computed, basically this is what they made on their projects. About 5% less than the cost of equity, which is the cost of raising the funds to take those projects. They violated investment, the investment principle, right? Don't take investments that earn less than the hurdle rate. The typical target firm in a hostile acquisition has had a stock price that has underperformed its peer group. So not only have they taken bad projects, but you as a stockholder have felt the pain. And here's the third piece of, third commonality you see across targets and hostile ta takeovers. They tend to be run by managers who own very little of the stock in the company. So if I were to summarize this evidence, and I'm not saying every, every hostile acquisition target meets these requirements. The typical target firm in a hostile acquisition is a badly managed, badly run firm where the managers really don't have much to lose as stockholders. Basically, they have a lot to lose as managers, but there's a separation. I mean, remember the, the, the old saying that the threat of an impending execution focuses the mind? These are the firms that get targeted in a hostile acquisition. And the minute they get targeted, these managers magically become much more receptive to what you as stockholders have to say. Okay. I mean, I, let's make this real. We've talked about Disney, and I showed you Disney's board in 1997. In 1997, Michael Eisner was at the peak of his powers. He had 10 really good years at the company, and he'd accumulated a tremendous amount of power, so he created this board of directors that was a rubber stamp. And in 1997, you go look through the, the, the news stories, there's nobody complaining about it. Then you had 98, 99, 2000, and Disney had a terrible period there between 98 and 2002. Stock price went down, every product. In fact, their, their big acquisition in the 1990s was what? what did, who did Disney buy in 1996? Cap Cities, ABC. Right? Basically, they said, trust us, we know what we're doing. And what we saw was who wants to be a millionaire five nights a week for, what, two whole years because they couldn't come up with any programs. They said, trust us, we're going to make money. It became something that drained cash. In fact, the irony in the, in the ABC acquisition is ESPN was thrown in as a rump. Eh, take this as well. And guess what the most profitable part of ABC is today? It's ESPN that makes the money. And you can see why. The best 30 minutes on TV is Sports Center. let's face it. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, when, I, when I'm on the treadmill, you can, it's amazing how much they can pack in those 30 minutes. <laughs> Those ABC programmers who do those sitcoms or one-hour shows could learn a lot by looking at SportsCenter, how they keep... I mean, I hate hockey. Actually, I don't hate hockey. I don't understand hockey. <laughs> People have tried to explain to me what icing is. Having never grown up around ice, I find this entire concept completely foreign to me. But SportsCenter still manages to keep me engaged. That's a miracle, right? <laughs> to get me through hockey till baseball season begins. And that's, what, several months away. But that acquisition went bad. So what I'm trying to say is the power that Eisner had in 97 started slipping away. He was getting closer and closer to that line, in the line I'm talking about, the piss-off line. And you could see the turmoil start to build up. Investors start to complain. In fact, in 2003, okay, Disney became the target of a hostile acquisition bid by Comcast. People don't even remember this because it was the oddest acquisition attempt I've ever seen. Because here's what Comcast did. You know how in acquisitions you take the market price and you offer a premium? Comcast offered a discount. <laughs> they said the stock is at 35. Would you sell the shares to us at 25? Clearly they were not doing this to acquire Disney. They sent a message to Disney saying, this is how little we think about you. We think your stockholders are so pissed off that they would sell your shares at $10 below the market price. It didn't quite work. But I think the message came through. And when companies get worried about the backlash, they start acting. And in the last 10 years, you've started to see some of the change 
in corporate governance. It's, it's small. It's incremental. It's, so year to year, you might not realize it, but it's happening. And here are some of the things that's happened, at least over the last decade. One is boards have become smaller over time. The median size of a board used to be 18, 20, 22, 20 years ago. Now it's closer to 10 or 12. Okay? Second, there are fewer insiders on the board, partly because of Sarbanes-Oxley, but partly because you know stockholders won't take that lying down. Third, directors are increasingly getting their compensation not in cash and pensions, but they're also getting a share of stock in the company. Okay? In other words, they're trying. To, it's, a, it's a very long haul, but you're trying to make directors think like stockholders. And finally, more and more directors are being picked based on nominating committees that at least in theory the CEO is not part of. The reason I say at least in theory is that committee is still looking over its shoulder and say, will the CEO like this guy? Will he? But they're not actually there. Okay? So you're starting to see changes in corporate governance. In fact, yesterday in the Wall Street Journal there was an article about another trend in the board of directors that's interesting that at least in these technology companies you see younger and younger people become. Chelsea Clinton is now on the board of directors for a company and she's worth 30. And that, again, is, is, is a change you would not have seen 15 or 20 years ago. So again, it's small, but you see the effects. And in the case of Disney, the way he reacted to the Comcast acquisition is finally he woke up. Woke up in what sense? He realized that part of the reason people were so pissed off at Disney was they felt that he controlled the board of directors. So if you look at 2003, this was his concession. Biggest concession was his personal lawyer is no longer part of the board of directors. Okay. The most egregious examples of conflict of interest are gone. There are still clearly conflicts of interest. But he said, you know what? I'm going to change the board. He also turned over. Remember he was the chairman of the board in 97? He turned that over to George Mitchell. Saying, this is all good. And in fact, Disney put together a whole set of corporate governance principles on its website, telling the world that they really, really, really cared about their stockholders. That's basically the bottom line is we've essentially taken power away from Michael Eisner and given it back to the stockholders. I'm not even going to go through the details of what they claim they did, but I want to talk about the impetus for this change, which was not from within. It was not like Eisner woke up one day and said, this is not fair to stockholders. I should give them back more power. It's because he was scared. You want CEOs to be a little scared in publicly traded companies of the stockholders. Because that's got to come into the decision process. If I make a mistake, what will the stockholder reaction be? And you can see that happening at Disney because it's coming from below. Ultimately, if you want change in companies, it's got to come from below. It can't come from above. And that basically means you and I as stockholders have to wake up and we have to have help. Somebody who's large enough as a stockholder who can make a difference, who's also willing to stand and fight for us. Okay. Now, in 2004... I mean, Eisner made those concessions. Turned out they weren't enough. Stockholder said, well, no, you're, you're done here. He stayed on for another year trying to reclaim his legacy and finally he gave up. He said, no, I can't hang on. And of course, you got a new CEO, Bob Iger, who's in a sense almost the anti-Eisner, right? Low profile, very little, I mean, at least on the outside, very little ego. So he comes in as CEO. And he creates his own board. So this is the 2008 board. First notice, it's much smaller, right? It's not the 17 members. It's now down to 12. There are no insiders. It is, it is a much, I'm not saying it's a more effective board, but it's clearly a more independent board. Boards often reflect their CEOs. And this reflects Iger's view of the company in 2008. He said, look, this is not my company. This is a company that I'm a CEO of that other people own, and I've got to reflect that. You might have heard the news story, though, that, that Iger is going to step down in 2015. Okay? That's a long lead time. But he's also going to become chairman of the board next year, which I think is a troubling. I mean, you think this is a one... But what I'm trying to say is corporate governance is not a one-way street where you claim power and it stays with you as stockholders. Sometimes you lose power again. So it'll be interesting to watch both what Eisner does over his remaining, because megalomania kind of builds up over time. You could start off as a guy with a low ego, but you be, you're CEO of a big company. People pay you so much attention and pay you so many compliments that after a while you start believing the hype. So sometimes the time to watch a CEO is not right after they start, but five years, six years, seven years. After good years, what do you do? So it'll be interesting to see how Iger manages his exit. 
and whether the next CEO is going to be an egomaniac or somebody who can essentially run co the company for its stockholders. Okay. Any questions on that first backlash? Though? The one thing I did not mention was using how come when you're not talking about compensation, that making managers behave like stockholders is, e is easy. And we used to think it was easy, right? What was the recipe in finance for making managers think like stockholders? Just give them stock or worse still, give them options. Let's deal with the more egregious case, which is options. What's the problem with giving managers options? They get equity in the company, but it's not the same equity that you and I own as common stock, right? It's an equity which has significant upside if things go bad and limited downside. It's an option. And I don't know whether you remember from foundations, you don't need to remember the option pricing model, but remember, options benefit when there's more risk. Right, you get the upside. So if you give managers options, should you be surprised about the fact that they're going to take on too much risk? I mean, they get the upside, they don't get much of the downside. So you're going to encourage too much risk taking if you give options. You're saying, why not stock? Stock actually works better. Restricted stock, in fact, is what many companies have shifted to. But there's a big difference, and this is from behavioral finance, between getting stock and buying stock. It sounds weird. You're either way, you're a stockholder. But when you buy stock, you actually have more, at, you seem to have more at stake than when somebody gives a stock to you. What I'm trying to say is, you can tweak compensation systems as much as you want, but you're still going to have this managerial view of the world that sometimes overwhelms the stockholder view of the world. So that's the first linkage. Right? Let's talk about the second link. Oh, one more thing. You think, what about legislation? Because after all, Sarbay and Oxley was written specifically for corporate governance, to improve corporate governance. I might be biased on this, but whenever I look at legislation, designed with the best of intentions. Here are the questions asked. What are the costs? I mean, every legislation is cost. So in the process of bringing the bad companies in line, you're going to create costs for companies that didn't have a problem on this. Okay. You think that's okay. We have to create a collector cost. You also have to ask about unintended consequences. You know why companies switched to giving options to managers in the 1990s? There was actually legislation in Congress which was designed to cap management compensation. So we went through one of these phases where, hey, CEOs are getting too much money. We've got to restrict how much they get paid. So the early 1990s, Congress passes a legislation that says if you pay more than X million dollars, it will not be tax deductible. But they define compensation as salary bonus, the way compensation was structured then. So you can already see what they set companies up to do. Companies looked at that cap and said, if we give cash or bonuses, we're going to hit the cap. But we give options, it doesn't seem to count. Okay, we had a whole, so unintended consequences is something you always have to worry about with legislation. I'm not saying Sarbanes-Oxley has not worked. I just don't see evidence that it's made that much of a difference in corporate governance. And the cost of inflicting this, you know, basically a bludgeon change, where everybody has to, has to do those you know, one, one through seven strikes me as not a great way to get corporate governance. I mean, the analogy I would give is if tomorrow I passed a law that says every voter should be informed. Easy to pass, right? We all agree. Every voter who comes into that, how are you going to enforce this law? What is, what is it going to mean? Are you going to ask people a you know, true or false question, 10 questions before? The, it's, it makes people feel good, but it's questionable as to whether it accomplished anything, anything in terms of the larger scheme of things. Which moves me to the final issue with corporate governance. We're pragmatists in corporate finance. We're not arguing for corporate governance because it's the fairest thing to do. We're arguing for corporate governance because we think it makes a difference in the way companies are run. And that again is an empirical question. Does good corporate governance pay off? And there's a whole strand or a whole stream of studies that have come out in the last decade. And again, I'll send you the links to these that have looked at this question. Basically, the question they're asking is, if I govern my, if the corporate governance in my company is strengthened, do my profits go up? Do my stock prices go up? I'll take the easy part of that first. It looks like markets reward companies for good corporate governance. Every 1% improvement in corporate governance. You know, how the heck do you even measure corporate governance? Remember those Yahoo scores that the, if you found them for your company, it's a number, 81, 75. Okay? This study actually looked at corporate governance scores for companies and noted that every time companies improve their corporate governance, so looking across companies, 
Companies with better corporate governance traded at higher prices. Higher price to book ratios, higher price to price earnings ratios. And there are other studies look look across markets and find that countries with poor corporate governance systems, stocks tend to trade at lower prices, lower multiples than companies with stronger corporate governance systems. So the evidence on stock prices seems pretty good. But there's also a whole set of studies that have tried to look at the board of directors specifically. Because remember all the things we said about the board of directors? We want them to be smaller. We want them to be more independent. We want them to be smarter. And there the evidence is much weaker. For instance, there's very little relationship between stock returns and whether you have insiders on the board. You'd think there'd be a strong relationship. And part of the reason for that is you're not control. It's, it's the same company you're asking. So it's not, is Facebook a better managed company than Coca-Cola? Is will Facebook be a better managed company with a more independent active board? Because I think that Facebook's management has done a great job. But the question is, will they do an even better job with a board of directors that keeps them on their toes rather than a board that rubber stamps what they do? Okay. So corporate governance, it's not that if you have a smaller board or a more independent board, the stock price is going to go up. On average, it seems to. But for your company, anything could happen. Okay. And one final thing. If you look at these candle companies, Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, and you always look back at them, almost every company that you have this big scandal in, it doesn't have to be a U.S. company. Satyam Computers, you look at the board of directors, you, you almost always see a board of directors that's a rubber stamp board. It's very difficult to have a scandal of that magnitude get through in a company where the board of directors actually does its job of being a check on management. Now let's talk about lenders and the company. Remember I said, if you lend money to a company and you don't protect yourself, you are going to get ripped off. And Nabisco, that's exactly what happened. And remind me again, why as a Nabisco bondholder you lost value? You lent money to the company and it was a safe company, and you lent it at a rate that reflected the safe company. Then they did something, this leverage buyout, that made them a risky company. And if this were a fair word, what should they have done? They should have come back to you and said, hey, you know what, guys? You lent to us when we were a safe company. You charged us a 7% interest rate. You should really now be charging us 11%, right? That would have made the process fair. Or at least they should have given you the option of saying the game has changed, so we'll buy the bonds back from you at face value and we'll replace them with new debt. But remember, you did not build those protections in as a Nabisco bond order. You forgot and they took advantage of you. Post Nabisco, here are a couple of things that happened. One is pre-Nabisco, corporate bonds came with almost no covenants. You know what covenants are? Have you ever, t- ever taken a loan from a bank? Read the rest of the document. It tells you all the things you cannot do, right? Don't do this, don't do this, don't even think about doing this. Pre-1986, corporate bonds came with no covenants. The assumption was, hey, you don't need to restrict these companies. They will self-restrict themselves. Post-Nabisco, you look at corporate bonds, you see a lot more covenants built into corporate bonds. Not as many as in a typical bank loan, but much more protection. Post-1986 also, a lot of corporate bonds have become puttable bonds. You know what puttable bonds are? If you buy a puttable bond, it looks like a regular bond, but if the company does something really stupid that changes the rules of the game, like a leverage buyout, you're allowed to put the bond back to the company and say, I want my $1,000 back. Hey, if you're a Nabisco bondholder, that would be nice to have, right? Too late to protect the Nabisco bondholders, but again, if you let the process work through, the process will kind of fix itself. Third, financial markets. We did talk about companies sometimes lying to financial markets and holding back the truth. The truth eventually comes up. That's something we have to put on the table. It can never stay hidden forever. It might be two years, three years, be really good. You could hide it for five years maybe. But the truth eventually comes up. And when it does come out, what's the first thing that happens to your stock price? Well, it drops, right? You say, that's bad enough. But that's only the first layer of damage. So your stock price goes from $10 to $3. You've lost 70% of your value. You know the second thing that happens? Nobody trusts you anymore. You say, who cares? Remember when I showed you a financial balance sheet? What were the two items on the asset side? Assets in place and growth assets, right? What do growth assets rest on? Perception, expectations, hope, right? 
I have never understood growth companies that commit accounting fraud. I'm not condoning mature companies doing it, but at least I can see the, tr the mechanics of what you're doing. If you're a growth company and 90% of your value comes from what, what's going to happen in the future, why would you risk that to make your earnings per share last year be three cents higher or five cents higher? But that's exactly what you've done. So the damage is too layered. Your stock price goes down and it stays down because nobody trusts you. In fact, the first thing that should happen after these accounting scandals, the entire top management should leave, right? Because at the minimum, you would want that. In fact, I would argue post-2008, this is exactly the problem that banks face collectively. We don't trust them. So Citi can tell us that it's blue in the face. We've told you everything about us. And I say, oh, really? You've been telling that us three years and every quarter we wake up and something new pops up? Trust is a very important commodity in markets. And if you lose it, it's very difficult to reclaim it. And let's talk about society. I made, it, I made it seem like I didn't care about companies creating social costs. And that was not my intention. Clearly, companies create social costs. And if you cross a line again, there's a built-in response. But the built-in response depends upon how we as society really care about that cost. We like to talk about costs. We like to talk about being green. But after we talk about being green, we get into our SUVs and we, you know zip back to our you know, five-bedroom houses and you turn on the central air to 64 or the heating. To, I mean, we are not inter we, we have internally made up our mind as to what exactly being green means. But if we're truly, if we truly mean what we say, here's what should happen. You create a social cause, at some point you cross the line. Let's tobacco companies. And if you cross that line, a couple of things happen. One, of course, is you get sued, Right? So you have the trial lawyers entirely lined up saying, I'll sue you, I'll sue you, and I'm next in line. And juries have little sympathy for you because you're viewed as a bad company. Second, governments can tend to focus just on you and nobody feels sorry for you. So they can have tax rates be higher just for tobacco companies. Nobody feels sorry for you. Yeah, you're a bad company, you deserve it. You've got to be very careful that you don't end up on the other side of the line. But it's not, the, the societal cause, it's not fair because some companies will feel it a lot more than others. Okay, so if you're, it really depends on whether your customers and investors will take it out on you. You know what I mean by customers and investors? We talked about Apple last, last session. Right? If, uh, if customers of Apple think that it's unconscionable that they have these bad factory conditions in China and stop buying iPhones, Hey, you're going to feel it as an economic cost. If investors in Apple say, I'm going to sell the stock because it's a bad company, they're going to feel it. And Apple worries about that. You can tell because they're trying to do at least the, 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 the PR level damage control now. But if it really started hitting the bottom line, it won't be PR level. They're going to do something about it because the economic costs will start mounting up. But I'm saying it's unfair because if your customers don't care, then you can create social costs and just... So if you're Walmart, and I say you're, you're, your operation's in China, but if customers of Walmart say, look, I have no choice. This is what I can afford. The revenues and operating income and net income are unaffected by this. Do you blame them for saying, you know what? The social cost, but who cares? So ultimate... What the heck was that? Okay. <laughs> Ultimately, if you want companies to be socially conscious... You have to make it in the economic best interest to be so. Okay. So here's, here's the counter-reaction playing out. Managers overreach, you get more activist investors, you get hostile acquisition stockholders wake up. Lenders are, are exploited, then bond markets start to adapt. You have covenants, you have special types of bonds, all designed to pro pro you know, protect bondholders. You lie to financial markets, your stock price collapses, it stays down. So you, no, other, other companies learn from this process and maybe we shouldn't do that. And if you create too much in social costs, there's that blowback from those social costs. People take it out on you. You know what? No, so this is my argument. If you focus on market prices, these mechanisms will keep the system in place. But what gets in the way of this is again government stepping in and saying, this looks really bad, we'll protect you. So you bought those risky securities, you lost money, I step in and protect you. Or your company, you make a really stupid decision. I step in and say, you're too big to fail. 
If we view this on an incident by incident basis, a company by company basis, you say, well, that's okay. That company, so it, we needed to say. But what you change, of course, is the incentive structure for the future. And that's the cost that has to be built into this process. Because if you step into this process too often to intervene, you get the worst of both systems. You know what I'm talking about? You get all the terrible stuff that comes from a non-stock price system and all the terrible stuff that comes from the stock price-based system, all embodied in one system. So if you're going to go with market prices, you've got to go the distance. You've got to trust markets to meet out punishment and not get in the way because you feel that punishment is too harsh. Okay? It's, a, it's part of the process of working yourself back to a steady state. So I'm going to leave you with this page. And you don't have to pick this right now, but go through the list of objectives I've listed here. Okay. And for yourself, make your own judgment. I'm not going to push you in a particular... My biases are clear. I've told you where I'm going. Okay. But I want you to make a choice, and I want you to remember that choice. Because as I said last session, when you disagree with me for the rest of the class, it's often not going to be on the detail of what I'm doing, but because you have a different objective for your... You view your business as having a different objective. So go down that list and pick the objective that you're most comfortable with. And if it's none of the above then you have an obligation to list out what it is. You cannot run any entity without an objective. I mean, somebody actually came up to me yesterday and they worked at a nonprofit, And they said, what about nonprofits?" You know what? If you run a nonprofit, you need an objective too. Let's say you run a homeless kitchen or a homeless shelter. Okay? You got to tell me whether your objective is to provide shelter to the most homeless in which case you're going to build the biggest shelters you can, or to provide long-term housing to some of the homeless so they basically leave the homeless. And what you do then will be determined by that objective. Every institution needs an objective. So I don't care if your objective is different from mine, but pick an objective. And don't hedge, don't have five objectives. Pick a singular, a primary objective, and then you can talk about what else you care about on the side. So I'll leave you with the way I think about the objective in, in, in corporate finance. If you ask me to look at a company in a reasonably efficient market, what's a reasonably efficient market? It messes up, but it corrects itself. Okay? Where bondholders can protect themselves, because they've written in covenants and they're enforced by law, then I, I think maximizing stock prices works well in spite of all of its constraints. If you're in a publicly traded firm in inefficient markets, so if you're in East Europe, in Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary, markets that are still developing, where I don't trust the market price, but your lenders can protect themselves because they're banks, they can write in the covenants, then I'm going to ask you to maximize stockholder wealth rather than stock prices. You know what's the difference? Stockholder wealth is the actual value of your, so you need somebody to come in and assess the value. It's a lot, it's a lot more difficult, but you should focus on maximizing stockholder wealth. If you're in a market where, and you believe the market is inefficient and lenders could be exploited, then I think it's safest to maximize firm value. I'll, I mean, ultimately, I think firm value is the most, the most comprehensive objective. It's a question of whether you can put this into practice and turn it into measures that can actually be used to judge this company. So it was long discussion of the objective, but I think it's central to how you think about corporate finance. Think through the process. Make up your own mind. But do make up your mind. Don't kind of go back and forth. Don't kind of try to hedge, as I said, that's, because that's going to end up giving you decisions that you really cannot pick between, or decision processes you can, cannot pick between. Which lets me then start on what I call the first meat and potatoes topic. So right now, we've kind of, you're saying, if you're a, one of those liberal arts majors, you're probably saying, this is corporate finance. This is great. We haven't talked about a single number. <laughs> now, welcome to corporate finance, meat and potatoes. The days of numberless discussions are very shortly going to be behind us. Okay. So I want to start off talking about the investment principle. Remember again the investment principle? Let me restate the principle. Invest in projects slash assets that earn a return greater than your minimum acceptable hurdle rate. Right? And then I said the hurdle rate should reflect the riskiness of the investment and where you raise the money. I'm going to focus on one word, riskiness. And that's all we're going to talk about for the next three or four sessions. What is risk? How do we measure risk? And, and I threw that question out because, in a sense, it's not that easy to come up with a good definition. 
fact, let me step back a little and talk a little bit about hurdle rates. Hurdle rates are benchmarks. Basically, this is not, when you said, say my hurdle rate is 11%, you're not saying that's a good rate of return. You're saying that's a rate of return I need to make for this to be a good investment. So let me define what will go into a hurdle rate in a very general, general level. The hurdle rate for an investment should have two pieces to it. A riskless rate, what you could make on a guaranteed investment, plus some risk premium. So this isn't rocket science, right? it's common sense. So the questions we're going to try to ask and answer here are basically, when we talk about the risk in an investment, what is risk? How do we measure that risk? And second, how do we convert that risk measure into a risk premium? So let's start with the first of those questions. Right? What is risk? And I did look at some of the answers that you threw out, and they kind of cover the spectrum, right? Risk is uncertainty. The only problem there is we've replaced one nebulous word with another nebulous word, right? Because then I could ask you, what is uncertainty? You say, it's risk. And you can go back and forth. In fact, economist, uh, an economist 100 years ago drew this abstract definition. He said, risk is uncertainty you can measure. You see what I'm saying? Now, ba basically, if you cannot measure the uncertainty, it's not risk. Which strikes me as a very strange definition of risk. So if you're a company and you cannot measure risk, you don't worry about it, you don't build it into your decision process. So I think you can go back and forth between these two words and end up with no solution. If you've taken a finance class, it's hopeless because we've already brainwashed you. Right? Because when I ask you what is risk, what comes to mind? Standard deviation, beta. We've replaced risk with the, with the statistical number, which is a terrible way to think about risk. You know what risk is? Risk is that feeling in the pit of your stomach. As you sit there, looking at your terminal, watching the only stock you own melt down in front of you, and you can't get through to sell it. Risk actually makes you feel sick. Until you felt it, you really don't understand what risk is. I remember in the late 90s, going in front of investor groups and talking about risk. They were blasé about it. What do you mean risk? Markets go down, but they always go up. They hadn't, fe in 2009, if I talked about risk, I didn't even have to say what it was. People got it. Our oh, risk, I know what it is. I threw up three times last week. Hey, yeah, okay, you got it. There you go. That's risk, right? So I'm going to give you my favorite definition of risk because it kind of cuts to the core of how we think about risk in finance. It's several thousand years old. And it's a Chinese symbol for risk. A couple of things though before I put this up. I've been told this is the Chinese symbol for risk. I know no Chinese. So this could be a gigantic hoax pulled on me for all I know. This could be something obscene, right? <laughs> so let me fully protect myself. I've been told that this is a Chinese symbol for risk. But one of the problems with Chinese symbols is I think the Chinese need to figure out what symbols, because every time I put a symbol up, I get at least six emails saying, that's not the symbol, this is it. And I put replace that, and then six weeks later, no, this is it. I mean, they have like six different versions of the Chinese symbols going around. So this is one ch version of a Chinese symbol for risk. Okay? <laughs> so this way I'm fully protected. So don't jump on me if this is not the symbol you're familiar with. And the reason I like it, it's a combination of two symbols. Okay? It's a symbol for danger plus a symbol for opportunity. Risk is danger plus opportunity. That's a, tr that's a great definition of risk. Risk is not good. Risk is not bad. Risk is just there. It's a combination of danger plus opportunity. And part of the reason I like that definition is it links the two at the hip. It says if you want one, you've got to live with the other. I mean, who amongst us doesn't want opportunity? We all want to make 70% returns, right? So you come to me and say, I want to make 70% returns. The question I'm going to ask you is, how much danger are you willing to face? No, I don't like danger then don't ask for 70% returns. You know how many mistakes in corporate finance and investing would be avoided if we remembered the symmetry? I'll give you an example. Anybody here from Orange County, California? Okay, great county. You've got Disneyland right there. I checked San Clemente weather. It's 77 degrees today. I wish I were there. But in the early 1990s, the county declared bankruptcy. And they declared bankruptcy because the treasurer of the county decided to take a big chunk of the pension fund for the county and, I wouldn't say invest in interest rate derivatives, speculate on interest rate derivatives. And of course, speculation is always good when you make money, but it's terrible when you lose money. Happened to, guess wrong, wiped out 35 to 40% of the pension fund. 
It's a county that declares bankruptcy. Huge story. One of the wealthiest counties in the U.S. declares bankruptcy. Picked up on 60 Minutes. And I think it was Mike Wallace who did the story. Those of you who haven't seen Mike Wallace, tremendous interviewer. And he was interviewing the treasurer of Orange County, a guy called Bob Citron. It's actually ironic. You're the treasurer of Orange County. His name is Bob Citron. Eh? Uh, but I, guess, you know, I, guess, I don't think he renamed himself in Southern California. People often, you know, and after all, you've got what, Meta World Peace pay, playing for the <laughs> Lakers, right? So I don't think he did a Meta World Peace on himself. <laughs> Maybe his real name is Bob Citron. So this is the, the interview. Eh? So Mike Wallace asked him, Mr. Citron, why would you take pension fund money that's supposed to be invested in safe assets and speculate in interest rate derivatives with it? And here's what Bob Citron said. He said, because Charlie Clo told me I could make 15% with no risk. Which your first reaction is, who the heck is Charlie Clo, and why is he telling you these things, right? <laughs> Charlie Clo was actually the market strategist for Merrill Lynch in the early 90s. Merrill was actually a co-defendant of the lawsuit because of it. And maybe he said this. I don't think Charlie Clo would have said this. I don't know Charlie Clo, but I know market strategists. Have you ever heard a market strategist talk? They're incredibly slippery people. They're incapable of making a straight statement. You listen to a good market strategy. At the end of 30 minutes, say, what did he say again? I think he said markets would go up. No, no, I think he said markets would go down. No, I think they'd be flat. This way it's covered no matter what. So, but maybe Charlie Clow did say this in an honest moment or, when, or whatever. Yeah. Let's get back to the interview. Okay? So it's Bob Citron saying, because Charlie Clow told me I could make 15% no risk, and I'm not a finance person. What's his job again? treasurer of a county. I thought it was a finance job, but I must be mistaken. Okay? But let's step back. Do you have to be a finance person to know that if somebody walks up to you and says, you can make 15% with no risk, that they're lying? If you think you can make 15% with no risk, you probably also think that Rolex you bought on Canal Street for $45 is actually a Rolex. It says R-O-L-E-C-K-S. It's sometimes you get misspelling, right? $45. Don't expect perfection. You pay $45 for a Rolex. It's not a Rolex. You buy a Mickey Mantle rookie card for $5. It's not a Mickey Mantle rookie card. My son actually found one for $5. He was very excited. He said, it's $5. It's not a... I don't think so. You know? Might be some other Mickey Mantle. Check the spelling. In my, you know. So... When you think about this definition, it reminds you that when something sounds too good to be true, it's not true. Okay. Some of you might be familiar with the Bernie Madoff fiasco. I actually think it was extraordinarily clever. Because what did he promise people? He promised 8%. Not 15, not 20. 8%. With no risk. People said, well, I'm not being too greedy. Look, I'm asking for only 8%. The no-risk part, they kind of forgot. It's still greedy. It's just not you're as greedy as the next person. But if you're making 8%, there is risk. The risk showed up 15 years after you invested, but there is risk. So risk is danger plus opportunity. One way to frame what we're going to try to do in corporate finance is in corporate finance, we're not bungee jumpers. We don't take on risk for the sake of taking on risk. We take on risk because we get some opportunity to compensate. So one way to think about risk and return models in finance is you're measuring the danger in an investment. There could be a lot of danger. And then you're asking, how much opportunity am I getting in return for this danger? And if the trade-off looks good, you should take the risk. So risk is not r good. Risk is not bad. Risk is just there. If you're going to be exposed to risk, make sure you get an expected return to compensate. Not a guaranteed return, but an expected return. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to lay out some conditions. So we're going to talk about different risk and return models in finance. But before I do that, I'm going to lay out some things that I'd like to see in a good risk and return model. Then we'll look at the actual models that we have and see if we can get close. Here's what I'd like a good risk and return model to do. I'd like it to come up with a measure of risk that is not specific to an asset class. And I want, I want a measure of risk that works with stocks, bonds, real estate, all kinds of assets. Because as an investor, I have to decide between those investments. Second, a good risk and return model should be clear about what risks I will get rewarded for and what risks I should not be exposing myself to. So what is he talking about? Let's suppose I live across 
a six lane highway from a brokerage house. And every day, here's what I do. I get up in the morning, I run across the six lanes. It's a lot of risk, right? I could get run over. And I say, you know what? I need to make at least a 50% return. I'm exposed to a lot of risk. You're not going to get rewarded for that risk. I know it sounds like an absurd example, and it is an absurd example, but we're actually going to see that there's the equivalent of running across six lanes of a highway when you're exposing yourself to some types of risk. And those are risks you're not going to get rewarded for. Third, I'd like a good risk and return model to come up with a number that I can look at and say, this is a high number, this is a low number, this is an average number. Let me explain. If I told you that the standard deviation in IBM stock price was 43%, you know the follow-up problem you're going to have? Is, I don't know whether that's high or low or average. But if I told you that the beta, and even if you don't know betas, here's a factor that's going to come in. If I told you the beta for IBM is 1.2, you don't need anything else, right? Because if your beta is above one, you're an above average risk investment. We'll talk about the assumptions you need to make to get there. It's self-standing. Fourth, that risk measure needs to give me a way to get to a hurdle rate because ultimately that's what I care about. It's not what the measure of risk is, but what kind of hurdle rate comes out of this. And there's this final requirement that's a pain in the neck, which is if you have a risk and return model, it needs to work. Right? It needs to work in terms of explaining what actually happens out there. So the model we're actually going to spend a substantial amount of time laying the foundation for is the capital asset pricing model because it's a launching pad for every other model out there. And let me at least hit whether the model meets all those requirements. First, it will come up, it will come up with a measure of risk that applies across all investments. It measures risk as deviation of actual returns around an expected return. I'll come back and kind of flesh out what that means, but every investment, you can measure that. Second, it does specify what portion of that risk will get rewarded, and it makes the argument that the only risk you will get rewarded for is risk that you cannot diversify away in a portfolio. Again, I have to back that up because it's based on assumptions. Third, it measures that risk you cannot diversify away with a beta, which is scaled around one. It's self-standing. Fourth, I can use that beta to come up with an expected return, which is going to become my hurdle rate. And all I need to do is take the risk-free rate, Take the beta and multiply it by a risk premium I would demand for an average risk investment. A lot of estimation questions there. I have to come up with the risk free rate, the beta, and the risk premium. Give me a hurdle rate. And then I'm going to give you very tepid support for the model. It works at least as well as the next best model. Notice what I'm not claiming. I'm not claiming it works well. I'm saying it works at least as well as the next best model, and it's a lot simpler. We'll talk about the alternatives, but this is the base model from which we're going to build. Okay? So let's stop on that page. When we start back up on, on Monday, we will start with the model and build up from there.